Previously, we discussed polynomial fitting and used the vector norm to determine how well a different order polynomial models were fitting to our data set. Well, vector norms are important enough that they are getting their own video in this 13th episode of Computational Linear Algebra. And so let's start off by getting back to the basics of vectors. These are quantities that have both a magnitude and a direction. This shouldn't be new to you. The problem with vectors is that sometimes we don't necessarily care about the direction, or maybe in some cases we don't even really care about the magnitude. And what the vector norm allows us to do to a vector is it allows us to completely throw away our direction and give back just the magnitude. Now, why might you want to do this? Well, when using the method of least squares, remember, we are not finding an x vector in our linear system that is perfectly reproducing our b vector. Instead, we're projecting our b vector onto the column space of our a matrix and then finding an x vector that reproduces uh, that projection. But I want to pause and stop here because this is an approximation. By taking the difference between our b vector and the projection of our b vector onto our column space, we established our residual vector. Previously, I referred to this as the difference vector, and in some textbooks you might hear this referred to as the error vector. Here, from here on out, I'm going to refer to it as the residual vector, as I like that terminology a little bit better. If you couldn't figure this out by now, I'm kind of uh, updating this as I go along. But by taking the norm of this vector, we were able to get that numerical interpretation of how well our different order polynomial models were fitting to our data. We don't necessarily care too much about the direction of this vector, we only really care about the magnitude. Now we got this magnitude using something called the 2 norm of our residual vector, and this is also known as the Euclidean distance norm. But there are different vector norms. For example, there is also the one norm, otherwise known as the taxicab norm, where we are taking the sum of the absolute value of each one of the components of our vector. And again, this is called the taxicab norm because uh, of the idea like you're in downtown New York uh, and taxicabs have to follow things in different components. So you're measuring magnitude by way of components rather than going all the way uh, to the endpoint of such a vector as you would using Euclidean distance. But really, you could have any vector norm of order p using this formula right here. This is what we call the p norm formula, or just the uh, p norm, where you could have a 3 norm, or 4 norm, or 5 norm following this formula. You're just going to take the absolute value of each one of the components, raise each component to the pth power, and then take the pth root of the sum of all of those quantities. Now naturally mathematicians like to uh, pull this out to the extremes. I'll leave it up to you uh, to do this, but this actually gives us the next most common norm you might see uh, along with a 2 norm or a 1 norm, which is actually the infinite norm, which is just going to return the absolute value, uh, the maximum absolute value of all the components of our vector. I'll leave this as a good exercise for you uh, to do the proof of that should you want to see it. So folks, those are vector norms, but why would I make an entire video dedicated simply to vector norms if they could be summed up in this short of a video? Well, that's because they come up all the time in a lot of different instances and allow us to really simplify some of the mathematics that's going on. This is the residual sum of squares, which is used often in data science, and it's a formula that looks a little bit something like this. It will look very similar to what we did in the polynomial fitting episode to get our vector norm. This function is just a component of our b vector projected onto the column space of our a matrix. Whereas this y component is really just a component of our original b vector. So the residual sum of squares is just squaring each component of our residual vector and then summing those different components together. Well in reality that is just the 2 norm of our residual vector squared. And doesn't this notation looks so much cleaner than this nasty formula. If you don't like that notation, maybe you like our residual vector transposed right multiplied by our residual vector. Or you could think of this as a covector uh, right multiplied by our residual vector. 
Either way, this notation is much simpler, and so that's really what vector norms provide us the opportunity to do. They, they allow us to simplify things like the residual sum of squares, which by the way, the residual sum of squares actually shows up in other formulas or uh, equations. But most importantly, they allow us to separate the magnitude of our vector from the direction of our vector. And it's entirely up to you what vector norm you want to use to measure that magnitude. So folks, that is vector norms. This is a short, sweet, simple video, but it's a uh, important enough concept that I thought we should dedicate an entire video to vector norms. I'll do the same thing for matrix norms once we're ready to get there. But it's a very key concept that you're not going to be able to avoid if you're going to be doing anything in applied mathematics, physics, data science, machine learning, you name it, vector norms are coming up. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, don't hesitate to let me know in the comment section down below. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll hope to see you again next time.